let's go ahead and get started. So uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the University of Arizona iSchool Colloquium Series. My name is Berlin Loa. I am an assistant professor here and manager of the Knowledge River Program. It is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce today Dr. Sandy Littletree. Dr. Littletree is currently a lecturer at the University of Washington Information School and also a former Knowledge River Program Manager here at the iSchool. So I'm happy to see her back with us. Uh, she's an indigenous librarian and focused on the, and scholar, focused on the intersections of indigenous systems of knowledge and the field of library and information science. She's an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation, or Diné, and Eastern Shoshone. Dr. Littletree has uh, an MA in curriculum and instruction from New Mexico State University, an MS in information science from the University of Texas at Austin, and earned her PhD from the information school at the University of Washington. And I'd like to add that in addition to her many accomplishments as an academic, uh, Sandy is also a knowledgeable and kind mentor who works to support and encourage scholars in our field. Uh, welcome again to the University of Arizona iSchool Colloquium and welcome Sandy. Thank you, Berlin. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I hope everyone who's listening to my words today is feeling well and doing, doing okay. And thank you for um, taking time to join me today um, and listen to me talk. Um, it's a real honor to be invited to uh, give a talk at the University of Arizona's iSchool. And I wanna give a, a special thank to uh, Professor Jamie Lee who extended this invitation to me uh, to give this talk. Um, and you know, she's an extraordinary scholar whose research and engagement with ideas and people who has been really inspiring me for, for years since I started with the Knowledge River program. So thank you, Jamie, for uh, the invitation. Thank you, Berlin, for that, uh, for that introduction. And thank you to the iSchool for hosting me today. If you have questions during the talk, um, just feel free to use the chat feature and I'll be looking at those after the presentation. I probably won't be responding to them um, while I'm talking. Um, we're gonna have a lot of time afterwards for a conversation if you wanna hang around. Um, also, I'm not used to talking so much at one time, especially <laughs> right now after uh, all of the stay at home order. And I'm here in the Pacific Northwest where there's a lot of uh, smoke outside who's um, I think might be affecting my, my throat a little bit. So forgive me if I need to take a lot of water breaks or uh, if I need to, to cough a little bit. I've got my air purifier going right behind me. So with that, the title of my talk is uh, Coming Full Circle. And it is partially in reference to the fact that I did start my career in service to minorities, to LIS, uh, particularly Native and Latino communities um, at the University of Arizona, where I worked as the Knowledge River Program Manager from 2009 to 2012. And even though I was only there for three years um, at the University of Arizona, I really credit that time for um, as being really critical for me um, as I developed ideas and questions um, that led me to uh, start my PhD and that's leading me to come back um, to you all today. Um, so for me, coming full circle um, means honoring that responsibility to come back um, and try to reciprocate some of the gifts that I was given while I uh, worked with Knowledge River students and alumni and the Knowledge River community of supporters and I'm looking at the list of um, people that are joining in and I see a lot of familiar names. Um, so um, just thank you for, for joining me today. Um, I wish we could all be there um, in person together. Uh, but instead, I'm coming to you from my home in Olympia, Washington. Um, I live and work in what is now known as Washington State uh, on the territory of the Coast Salish people, uh, particularly the Squaxin Island people. Uh, for me, nearby um, to the north are the Nisqually and the Puyallup. Uh, to the south are the Chehalis. Uh, to the west are the Skokomish people. 
um, and among others um, who have all been um, caretakers of the Salish Sea for, for generations. Um, I am a Navajo woman. Um, I'm a guest here um, in the Coast Salish Territory. I married into the Squaxin Island tribe, but I'm still learning, um, you know, this history, the cultures, the community connections here. Um, I'm from the desert, um, from New Mexico, and so I'm constantly learning and relearning a, a new relationship with water and rain uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. So um, I encourage you, if you haven't done so already, um, you know, take some time to learn about the indigenous presence on the lands that you're occupy occupying today. Um, and I put a, a, a link at the bottom of the, of the slide um, if you want to learn about, uh, you know, where you're, the territory that you're on uh, as a place to start. Um, but I really encourage you to dig deeper, um, to ask questions, um, and to actually work to build um, relationships with Indigenous people who, uh, who come from this area, uh, from the area that you're at, if possible. And I want to acknowledge that um, since we're not in person, um, that I'm coming to you via screens and cables and networks and technologies um, that are giving us this ability to utilize um, high-speed internet to gather in this digitized format. And while I'm really grateful uh, for this opportunity and availability for us um, who have this technology, I'm also really aware that, uh, you know, big percentage, 65% so um, of Indian country has access to wireless uh, services. And the pandemic that we're in has heightened um, this lack of connectivity for Native people, for many Native people. So it's possible um, that my talk today will be inaccessible to many Native people, which is unfortunate. Um, but as Native people, we find ways to connect and use the tools that are available to maintain our relationships. Um, so this photo here um, was taken, taken by my cousin in New Mexico. I asked him permission if I could share this um, as he delivered supplies to Navajo families during the height of the pandemic. Um, and this was a bus. Um, this is a bus that um, was getting Wi-Fi out to the communities that didn't have access. So again, you know, we use the tools uh, that are available to us. I also want to just quickly um, say I wanted to dedicate this talk to Professor Allison Carlisle. Um, he challenged me to think of better ways to explain my really jumbled thoughts about indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, we're having a memorial service um, for her, for Professor Carlisle uh, later this week at the information school. So she's on my mind and in my heart. Um, she was on my dissertation committee and her questions gently guided me to provide better explanations of phrases and words that I thought uh, were really self-explanatory, like indigenous ways of knowing and uh, traditional cultural expressions and indigenous systems of knowledge. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today actually started with an email um, that Professor Carlisle sent me um, a few days before my dissertation proposal um, in 2016 when she asked me to be more clear about the words and the phrases that I was using. Um, and since then, you know, I've been able to work on those definitions and I've actually been able to share a similar presentation to audiences um, in New Zealand and Canada and different parts of the US. Um, so it's possible that you might have already seen me give um, a version of this talk um, about this model. Um, and I won't take it personally if you feel like, you know, you've heard this before and you want to uh, do something else with your afternoon or your evening, um, that's fine. Um, but perhaps there's a reason for you to engage with these ideas again um, in your current situation, in our current situation. Um, and also I have a forthcoming um, co-authored article in the journal Knowledge Organization that's coming out. They tell me every day, every time I check in with them, it's coming out soon. Um, where this model is going to be further explained and the, the article will be titled um, Centering Relationality, a Conceptual Model to Advance Indigenous Knowledge Organization Practices. And I want to give a huge uh, thank you and acknowledgement to Drs. Marisa Duarte and uh, Dr. Miranda Bellardi-Lewis for co-authoring that piece with me. 
and helping me to think through um, these ideas. And finally, before I really um, get started, I just want to acknowledge um, the recent, you know, the things we're going through, pain, um, trauma, suffering related to COVID-19, um, dislocation, financial strife, uh, fires and smoke in the West for those of us in uh, California, Oregon, Washington, and elsewhere, uh, impending storms and hurricanes, um, as well as you know, widespread violence against brown, black, and indigenous people that have been happening for a long time, but they are now reaching um, new heights of awareness um, this summer, particularly, um, including uh, the recent deaths of soldiers at Fort Hood Army Base, uh, which included two of our Navajo relations. Um, I know I don't have to spell out um, all of these disparities and, and complications that this year has suffered for, for many people, uh, but I just want to take a moment to uh, remember the people who are lost or missing or injured recently. Um, if you want to just take a breath, uh, prepare your brains for the next part of this presentation, uh, maybe just take a few moments to look away from your screens, rest your eyes, um, just for a moment with me. Thank you. So I have um, failed to properly introduce myself. She Sandy Little Tree Yanisha, Eastern Shoshone Nishlant Do Kiaani Bashishi, Eastern Shoshone Dasha Che Do Tatnazoni Dashanella. My name is Sandy Little Tree. Um, I am Eastern Shoshone from both of my mother's parents. I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation or Diné from the Towering House people from my paternal grandmother's clan and from the Tangled people uh, from my paternal uh, grandfather's clan. So I am an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation, uh, originally from Northwest New Mexico. And if there's a, any Navajo speakers uh, listening to me, um, or if you've heard anyone uh, speak in Navajo, you might have guessed that I am far from being a fluent speaker of the Navajo language. Um, both of my parents went to uh, Indian boarding schools. Uh, my dad is a first language Navajo speaker. My mom is a monolingual English speaker, despite the fact that um, her grandmother who raised her spoke multiple native languages, including um, in addition to English. Uh, but our family were raised uh, with Navajo spoken in certain family gatherings, Navajo on the radio as my dad uh, worked on the house, but we primarily heard and spoke English. And so why is this family story important um, for my talk today? I think like a lot of Native people of my generation, um, my connection to my ancestral languages and ancestral knowledge has been severely limited due to colonization. Um, and I enter into this work with deep personal connections and motivations to understand how colonization has impacted me um, and my family and others like us. Um, and to understand how knowledge and information continues to flow in our communities despite the legacies of colonization um, and the histories of self-determination. Um, I'm interested in how Western institutions such as libraries, archives, uh, and institutions of higher education either continue these legacies of colonization by continuing to maintain that status quo or try to mitigate those harms done to indigenous communities by acknowledging the impacts of colonization and making spaces for indigenous perspectives. This picture here is of uh, myself and my dad, mom, my brother, and some of my nephews uh, visiting the place of uh, my dad's birth on the reservation. So I share this with you just um, to emphasize, especially to uh, new PhD students, people who are starting their work in this area, um, that our experiences are valid points of entry 
um, into this type of research. And I encourage you to, um, to use that um, as part of your work. I have to credit um, a lot of people who came before me who opened doors in academia to allow us to incorporate our perspectives and indigenous research methodologies into our work. Um, I'm thinking here of the first person listed, uh, Linda Tuhiai Smith, whose book uh, Decolonizing Methodologies was essential um, for my work, as well as uh, people around the world and designing ma meaningful research for and with indigenous communities. And I just wanted to take a moment to say that I stand with her and her colleagues as they face challenges to their work um, at the University of Waikato and um, Atiora. Um, and so I acknowledge her and all of the scholars, colleagues, uh, friends, my students, um, including Knowledge River students who have helped uh, pave the way for this type of work. Um, and listed here are just a few, um, a few of the people who've inspired me, whose work is published. Um, and I encourage you to read them, um, cite them in your work if you're headed down the same path. Um, and again, include your own stories, um, acknowledge your own positionalities as you're entering into these uh, research conversations. What I'm about to share is a framework for um, understanding the important role of relationality um, and relational accountability in research and library and information services, um, hopefully um, in teaching or whatever um, area that you're um, coming at this from. It's based on life experiences, on research, on personal observations. My work as a librarian, my work as an educator, my work as a scholar. Um, sometimes uh, when I look at the framework, not this one, but the, uh, the framework that I'll share with you in a second. Sometimes when I look at it and when I share it with Native people, it seems really obvious. And, you know, when I was telling my sister the other day about this talk that I was going to give um, here, um, I felt a little silly um, describing it um, because it really is kind of second nature to many of our families and, and those of us in our communities that, that are living it. It's second nature. Um, when my dad asked me a couple of years ago, uh, about a class that I was teaching and I told him it was called um, Indigenous Systems of Knowledge. And he said, you know, he's a very wise, you know, he's in his 80s now. Um, and I said, you know, Indigenous Systems of Knowledge. And he said, what is that? Um, and so I just want to be honest and say that what I'm sharing today is really heavy with academic purposes. Um, I don't know about your family, but in our family, um, we don't sit around the table using words like indigenous systems of knowledge or relationality. Uh, these are really academic terms that academics like me, uh, maybe you, um, use to talk and write about these, um, these everyday lived experiences that frankly never needed labels. Uh, we never needed diagrams um, to explain it until we had to explain it. Um, in our Western institutions who, um, who hold different values. The other thing is, um, even though I'm giving an indigenous perspective on library services, I just want to emphasize that my own personal perspective is limited. Um, I don't claim to know everything about Native people and, and libraries. I don't have all of the answers. Um, I encourage you to come along with me um, and try to build on um, what I'm talking about today, uh, to question it, uh, to give feedback, um, make it your own, um, use it in, in a way that makes sense for you. And these are just some questions, and I realize there's a lot of words here on the screen, but some things to think about as I'm, um, as I'm sharing this framework. Um, you might think about your, what is your per personal responsibility to ensure that you're actively working to make spaces for indigenous perspectives in your library, your archive, or your institution? Um, how can relationality inform your teaching philosophy? What role do stories play um, in your teaching or research? And how do you consider the deeper role of stories? 
for Indigenous communities? How can community values like relationality inform your teaching, your research, your practice? Um, and how can Indigenous ways of knowing broaden your, um, your perceptions of uh, information and knowledge? It's just some things to think about. I'm curious to hear what, what you all um, take from this presentation. So just a few words about why this is important. Um, so the, the collection, the classification, the manipulation, the storage, the movement, the retrieval, the dissemination, the protection of information are hallmarks of our information science field. Um, and we can think about all of these aspects of our field as they intersect with indigenous systems of knowledge. And as I've said many times before, there is so much at stake for Native communities for each of these hallmarks. So we can think about the collection of Indigenous knowledge or the collection of books and materials written by or about Native people, the classification of Indigenous knowledge, the storage, the movement, the dissemination of Indigenous knowledge through our information systems, and the mechanisms to protect or not protect indigenous knowledge. We can think about uh, some of the problems that come with these intersections. Uh, a lot of the knowledge that exists in our information institutions, such as libraries and archives, has been written about, has been researched, has been documented, collected, and organized by non-native people. And I've used this uh, statistic uh, before I need to find a, an updated one, but in 1998, Donald Fixico reported that more than 30,000 manuscripts had been published about American Indians, and more than 90% of that literature had been written by non-natives. Non and so the, the damage of outsiders writing about Native people um, is demonstrated in this um, 2020 book review that um, that I just came across written by Lakota columnist uh, Delphine Redshirt as she reviews a book uh, written by an outsider, by a non-Lakota author who is clearly causing harm um, through his book. Um, and she writes, our Lakota history is important for us as tenacious peoples. We cannot allow outsiders to feign or fake interest in us while harboring disdain or racism and continue to write dangerous or racist history about not only us, but other Native peoples. Um, and this book review is very, you know, she does it because she feels like she needs, she has to say something about it. Um, and how many of us as, as Native people have come across books written by outsiders about our, our tribe, our culture, and felt that harm um, coming through pages? Um, because we really, we have great needs for these systems to work for us. Um, we need these institutions uh, for language documentation and revitalization efforts. Um, we need these institutions for recovering language with, within songs and dances, for the creation of art and films and books and technology. Um, we need these institutions to help us manage and document family histories and personal stories and cultural heritage. We need these institutions for legal research, for land claims, for medical and health research, for educational research, every, every kind of research imaginable, um, as well as for indigenous faculty and scholars to engage in um, scholarly communication and research in these areas. Uh, we need these systems to work for us. It reminds me of, um, <laughs> When I was in high school, um, I recall um, wanting to write a research paper on uh, Navajo culture. Uh, and I don't remember what the exact assignment was. Um, I don't remember thinking about asking my dad or other relatives for information. That's kind of a whole other um, issue. Um, but I do remember um, going to my high school library and looking for some kind of source that I could use. Um, I'm pretty sure that I didn't ask the school librarian for help because I didn't know that that was her job. Um, I didn't know that she was there to help me or that she, um, that she was there to help me. 
look for books. Um, and this was the only book that I could find in my library. And I really, I cherished it when I found it. Um, later on, I found out that it was written by a, a non-Native person. And maybe I did, you know, I must have read that. Um, it's right there in, you know, the introduction of the book. He talks about how he gathered his information um, and his acknowledgments, acknowledge a bunch of scholars first, and then you know, eventually he gets to thanking the Native people that helped him. Um, but as a teenager, you know, I didn't really understand, you know, where this type of information comes from. Um, and even as a young person, um, you know, going to the library looking for this type of information. I know that I'm not the only Native person who's turned to libraries or archives to search for this kind of information to help us understand um, different parts of our culture. Um, and for me, this story and this, this book really represents the possibilities, um, but also the challenges and the barriers that we have with the classification, the manipulation, the retrieval, the dissemination, the protection of indigenous knowledge. Um, here I have the catalog record for that book, and it might be too small for you to read, um, but it does, you know, talk about Navajo, the, the subjects are Navajo mythology, um, Navajo Indians, uh, religion, and Indian is spelled with an, an E for some reason. Um, so we think about, you know, how this book is described in the catalog, you know, the size, um, the number of pages, um, but does it tell us anything about uh, the knowledge that may be in there that may need to be protected or handled with care, uh, that some of these stories need to be only told in, uh, when there's frost on the ground, um, or you know, does it contain any inaccurate information? Um, and I also think about you know, the relationship between a librarian and a Navajo uh, student coming into a place like this to find that information. Um, what can we learn from, from this example of, you know, creating information environments that, um, that makes, makes room for Indigenous perspectives, but also privileges Indigenous perspectives uh, for each of those hallmarks that I mentioned of our field. You know, how can we learn from Indigenous communities that can inform our work in libraries and information services uh, what will it take for information institutions to acknowledge the problems of coloniality that have, that's been caused for Indigenous knowledge, but also to imagine new ways of engaging with Indigenous communities. Um, and so because our field is based on these understandings of knowledge and information and with so much at stake for our Native communities, I think that the use of indigenous systems of knowledge as an intellectual construct that centers on relationality really should be critical um, to our research and to our practice. So here it is finally. Um, so I'm going to uh, go through each of these layers. So bear with me um, as I go through this for the, the next part of this presentation. I just want to reiterate that um, this is a generic framework that I'll be talking about. It isn't meant to be tribally specific. Um, and you, while you can apply tribal specific ways to this framework, it's really not meant to replace uh, like a specific framework such as uh, the medicine wheel or the Navajo epistemology framework, any specific philosophies or spiritual thinkings or teachings from uh, different tribes. Um, I also want to note that, I don't know if you can see it in this uh, presentation, but there are no solid lines here. Um, all of these elements um, are impacting each other. None of these elements are working in isolation. Um, and so I'm imagining this like a drop of water um, that centers on relationality in the middle there. And depending on how strong um, that drop is, um, and how permeable all of those layers are, um, going as far as, as we can into those, the institutions. Um, depending on how strong that is, it'll allow that energy of that relationality to be carried all the way through to our institutions. And if it's treated with uh, respect, I'm imagining, um, you know, it can be also reciprocated and carried back to communities and to that source of relationality and 
um, interacting with each other in, in a good way. So I'm going to come back to this um, full diagram in a second. I'm going to take away some parts here. Hope everyone is still with me. So I'm going to focus on these two um, outside layers, uh, the institutions and the expressions of indigenous systems of knowledge. In mainstream Western practices and library practices, archival practices, we often focus on that surface level, uh, on the objects, on the stuff, on the expressions of knowledge that show up in books and articles and documents and films, um, things that we collect and maintain in our collections. And we try to come up with descriptions, with organizational practices for this stuff. Uh, we showcase photos of unidentified Native people and, location, and unidentified locations and digital collections. Uh, and we do this without considering you know, what's in that, that core. Uh, where, where did these expressions come from? Um, and we do this without focusing on the humans and the ontologies and the epistemologies that have informed these collections. And so without uh, acknowledging those, um, and without acknowledging the impacts of colonization that, have, that uh, has happened to these communities of origin. Also remembering that sometimes there are people who have been disconnected from their ancestral knowledge that often come here um, at these uh, surface layers um, as part of their journey to dig deeper. Um, they come here to add to their knowledge. So just remembering that, you know, that there's a core here, a, a process of how this stuff ended up in our institutions. Um, so how do, we, how do we fill in this gap? We can start by with an understanding of relationality. Um, relationality is what distinguishes indigenous uh, ways of knowing from Western uh, knowledge in a really fundamental way. Um, as Indigenous peoples, through our relationships, uh, we belong to our landscapes, to our places, our histories, our languages, ceremonies, peoples, families, nations, clans. Um, and this responsibility of our belonging helps us live a balanced and good life. I really depend on uh, Cree scholar Sean Wilson's um, conceptualization of relationality um, in my work. Um, where he acknowledges that we all exist in relationship to each other, to the natural world, to ideas, to cosmos, to objects, to ancestors, future generations. And not only that, we're, um, that we exist in relationship with all of these, but that we're also accountable to all of these relationships. So the re relational way of being is considered by many to be the heart of what it means to be indigenous. Um, relationality is dynamic. It allows us to participate actively in our world, um, ensuring that our interactions are um, compassionate and caring, um, and that we're accountable to uh, those who we relate to. And not just people, but um, non-humans, uh, non ideas. Um, Wilson uh, writes that, quote, Identity for indigenous people is grounded in the relationship with the land, their ancestors who have returned to the land, and with future generations who will come to being on the land. Rather than viewing ourselves as being in relationship with other people or things, we are the relationships that we hold and are a part of. And so relationships energize the ways that we interact with the world and our ways of knowing um, that emerge from these experiences. Um, relationality is also informed by holism, um, a, a concept described by Joanne Archibald uh, that refers to the interactions between the intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and physical realms to form a whole healthy person as well as healthy communities. I'm not going to dive into those details, but I encourage you to read Indigenous Storywork um, and our forthcoming um, article to learn more about that. So once you understand that everything starts with relationships and relationality, um, the rest of this uh, circle starts to get filled in. So what are some of those most important relationships that um, Indigenous people have? Um, belonging to a people, um, 
people who claim you as much as you claim them is really an important part of what it means to be indigenous. And I use the aspects of peoplehood um, to describe that. Uh, peoplehood is a, as depicted here in this image by uh, Tom Holm, uh, Dan Pierce, Pearson, and Ben Chavez, um, situates an indigenous person's sense of self and belonging as an outcome of uh, the people's connections to their language, their sacred history, uh, their ceremonial cycle, and continuous habitation uh, within a place or territory. A person is indigenous because of their relationships within the sphere of activities that are determined by their people. Um, and these are those elements that make up that layer just directly outside of that relationality circle. I also want to acknowledge that um, for some indigenous people, for some native people, their relationship with some of these elements of peoplehood may be stronger or weaker. Um, for instance, you know, colonization displaced a lot of people from their original territories, uh, their traditional territories. There's, we have a lot of experiences of removal, of um, assimilation, Indian boarding schools that have corroded indigenous people's relationships with, uh, with all of these elements, with language, land, ceremonies, um, their sacred history. Um, but I think that despite the effects of colonialism, um, indigenous people still have this continuous interaction with these activities, um, even though, even if their strongest relationship existed with their ancestors. So uh, filling in the next layer um, is that third from the center are those indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and our diagram is getting close to completion. I hope you're still with me. So indigenous, um, indigenous ways of knowing, these are, these are the activities. These are the, the things that we do um, in that peoplehood matrix that inform our systems of knowledge. Um, these are the ways that people have been creating, transmitting, categorizing, preserving knowledge since the beginning of time. So stuff has to happen. There's gotta be some kind of action, right? We start with that, um, the center of relationality um, and it interacts with the, those elements of peoplehood, but we found some kind of action, nothing, um, nothing can come of it. Um, so these are the verbs. These are the active processes, the story work, the observing, uh, the creation of art, um, the interactions with elders and children, um, the hunting, the praying, uh, the fishing, the listening, the running, dreaming. Um, the circle could be filled with endless activities, um, such as the ones listed here. There's so many more that, that people could come up with. Um, but these are the experiences that we have when we exercise our relationship with our family or clan, with ideas, with all of those elements in peoplehood, our language, our land, our ceremonies, um, and our sacred history. So we're now um, at the surface um, of those expressions of indigenous systems of knowledge. So I'm at the, the second to the um, outermost layer. Um, these are the, the manifestations um, that come from uh, those activities the things that come out of it, the things that are more tangible, maybe taking a physical form like weavings, potteries, buildings, weapons, gardens, but also the intangible manifestations such as songs, uh, prayers, dances, uh, gardening practices, uh, food recipes, hunting techniques, um, the medicinal plant knowledge. Um, and I rely on um, White Earth Chippewa and Choctaw scholar uh, Clara Sue Kidwell's description of indigenous uh, expressions of indigenous knowledge. So these are those mis these uh, discernible manifestations of knowledge, those nouns that are created when we exercise our relationships with the land, with water, ceremonies, peoples, stories, observations. Um, and these are the things that we that we often. Um, handle and, and see in, in our institutions. So finally, we're at, there we have 
sorry, I missed that slide, some of those uh, discernible manifestations. And again, this could be filled with uh, all kinds of examples. So we reach the surface, um, the outermost layer, the, the institutions. Um, if they're libraries, uh, archives, uh, they may be collecting, um, cataloging, preserving uh, some of those expressions. Um, for many of these institutions, their approach uh, may only address those top two layers of, our, of this model, just the institutions and you know, superficially just those expressions of um, indigenous systems of knowledge. Um, and I think that kind of approach is um, narrow-minded. It really results in you know, some ignorance about you know, the essence of these objects and of these ideas and um, you know, the, the communal and family relationality, the complex ways of knowing that, that had to happen uh, to result in their making. And if you ignore those relationality that's infusing uh, an object or a book or document um, with meaning, the institutions, I think, re risk breaching protocol when engaging with indigenous communities. But we can also imagine, and we also have examples of institutions that are practicing, uh, employing practices that really acknowledge uh, relationality, the, that relationality that's undergirding that creation of indigenous knowledge. Um, and they have an understanding that, uh, you know, these lines um, separating these layers aren't solid, um, that there's room um, for that center of relationality to really radiate out. Um, and not just to those expressions of indigenous systems of knowledge, but um, into institutional practices, policies, pedagogy, uh, methods of research, um, and more. The possibilities of making spaces for how indigenous people engage with the world, with people, with places, ideas, um, really can expand when you really uh, focus on that, that, first, um, that first center, you know, centering on on relationships. And finally, we have um, the full diagram. Um, this is um, where we can address what cradle is cradling this entire system. Um, and I have reciprocity, responsibility, and respect. The importance of handling knowledge with all of these, with respect and responsibility, stems, stems from relationality. Um, Anishinaabe scholar um, Alison Krebs reinforces this idea, reminding us that, quote, um, indigenous peoples, as indigenous peoples, we exist within dynamic and interactive web, webs of relationship governed by mutual respect, reciprocity, and relational accountability. And I designed this um, to resemble a cradle because of the importance of, of cradles and cradle boards for many of our native communities as ways to protect um, future generations. So there's a lot of unwritten protocols that govern relational account accountability in indigenous communities. Uh, for example, like knowing when and um, how to receive and give gifts, um, understanding seasonal influences on stories and teachings, um, honoring clan member responsibilities, um, these are all orally transmitted um, and learned activities that inform relational um, way of being. These are unwritten. Um, but we do have some um, other ways of um, applying written guidelines, such as the protocols for Native American archival materials, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander protocols um, that develop practices of uh, respect uh, of indigenous systems of knowledge um, and I know I'm missing um, others that I probably, uh, that I could give examples of, but I encourage you to, um, to look into these protocols and also to engage with Linda Tuhiai Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies um, and other indigenous, uh, indigenous focused research methods that, uh, where you can base your work. So to understand and make room uh, for indigenous perspectives and in research and in libraries, um, in the methodologies and the means by which indigenous peoples create protocols to uh, name, to articulate, to collate, to, to make accessible um, these expressions of knowledge. 
Um, it requires all of us, um, librarians, educators, researchers, to really uh, recognize the importance of relationality. And I think it's imperative to be accountable, to remember that accountability to all of our, our relationships um, throughout our work. So I just wanna return to you know, some of those questions, um, you know, thinking about your responsibility, um, you know, how can this inform your work, your teaching, your research, um, thinking about um, you know, how does relationality inform um, your practice? And you know, can indigenous ways of knowing broaden um, your, your perceptions of indigenous, uh, of information and knowledge? So I'm looking forward to a, a conversation with you all. Um, and with that, I also wanted to just say, you know, I did, I wanted to dedicate this to Alison Carlisle, but there's also a number of people who've passed um, in the past year and, uh, you know, over the years that has really influenced this work. So I wanted to uh, acknowledge them as well. So with that, I will end my part of the presentation or the formal presentation and uh, look for, for us to have a conversation. Perfect. Oh, go ahead. Jamie, sorry. <laughs> oh, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Littletree. Um, so for any of you all who have any questions, um, please, I guess the most organized way to do this is if um, you go down into the Zoom console and, and the things pop up. <laughs> Sorry, I can't describe this very well. Uh, under participants, click that and you have an option to raise your hand. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Or you can unmute yourself and ask the question, I guess, <laughs> if that's hard uh, to do. Or here we go, sorry, people in the chat. I'm seeing Carrie's suggestion to stop my screen, so I will do that. Here we go. Um, and as per Dr. Lee's uh, suggestion, type your questions in the chat as well. It looks like Nicole uh, ah. has her hand raised. Okay, Nicole, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Lutri. I really, really enjoy uh, how you present that information and, um, and share your knowledge with us. And I was just wondering if you could speak to um, tribal librarian staff and um, their relationship to uh, promoting indigenous knowledge as well as um, kind of making a space for themselves in the LIS field um, as kind of culture keepers and working within, you know, the library as an institution. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're in a unique position where you are, you're interacting with that knowledge on a day-to-day -day basis, right, within your, your institution and, you know, providing those uh, services for your community. So, you know, I think as far as, you know, representing that into like an LIS field, um, you know, speaking about, you know, different practices of, um, you know, how, you know, policies of uh, collecting and, you know, um, you all know your communities best. And I think, you know, the examples um, and the unique experiences of tribal libraries and archives, um, I think we can learn a lot from you all of how, um, how you all are dealing with um, this knowledge and this information that's coming out. Um, so, you know, I would encourage you all to, um, you know, share 
share that if 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 you if you feel comfortable um, because it is different right because you know in our information field we're you know, things that um, may not be as appropriate to share out, uh, maybe that aren't of, as interested um, for our communities. Um, so, and I just got a thing here, it says my, I'm not. And she's disappeared. Does that kind of, I know it, that, that didn't really <laughs> answer a lot of questions, but is there something specific about tribal libraries that you were, that you were thinking about? Uh, there's there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot that I think about and um, I think one of the big things that I see is um, you know these ideals uh, that are in you know LIS uh, programs and in our theories and then the reality of actually managing libraries or you know dealing with tribal politics dealing with um, different contexts locally. Yeah, that's a whole other thing that I didn't even touch on here. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, the politics, the, you know, the, the realities that, you know, I was, I, I was been thinking about this model as, you know, it's, it could be perceived as kind of like this pristine, like ball of, you know, stuff that, you know, if, if there was no interactions with, you know, uh, politics or, you know, uh, everything else that we're dealing with of, um, you know, issues on our, on our reservations. Um, that it could just, you know, exist as this perfect ball of, you know, these layers and we could get to it really easily and um, interact with all of these things. But in reality, yeah, I mean, there's all these other um, intersections and things that are making it hard to, um, to access uh, parts of these, uh, these layers. Um, and so, you know, I think just recognizing the coloniality and, you know, recognizing those barriers and, you know, acknowledging them um, as part of that, um, the process of um, imagining, you know, spaces for um, Indigenous communities that we can, you know, once again, you know, have really great relationships and um, maintain those layers um, so that, you know, where institutions can um, not just like take from um, that center and like use those in our institutions, but also to like give back and like to contribute to all of those different layers of, um, of our, our ways of being. Um, but yeah, in reality, there's, there's a lot of day-to-day um, -day stuff that gets in the way of it. And, you know, it, it isn't perfect. Um, and I think that is something that, um, that we have to deal with. Um, tribal politics, funding, um, you know, support, um, technology, um, uh, staffing, uh, you know, getting uh, expertise, uh, time, all of this stuff is really kind of like surrounding all of this and making it harder to like maintain all of those, those layers of um, indigenous, you know, the things that we really would want to do. Um, so I think that's part of, you know, your training as a librarian is to like decide, you know, you're making those decisions, um, you know, what is, what is the best path forward um, given all of these um, problems and in our institutions. Um, so, yeah, does that, does that help? If anyone has 
And I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Lundry. I was just gonna say, are there other, other questions? Yeah. Um, oh, uh, Dr. Lee asks, um, so I guess a better system to go by would be for um, questions to just be thrown in the chat um, and I will read them out unless you would like to ask them yourself. Um, but Dr. Lee asks, when teaching this model, what are the aha moments that your students have? What is the process like for them to understand the depth of the rationality, uh, relationality rather? You know, I haven't had a chance to um, teach this model um, yet <laughs> to a class. Um, at least to an, L, to an LIS class. Um, I've given presentations, I've given this presentation uh, to different audiences and I've seen a lot of aha moments. That's, that's kind of the bummer of, of um, you know, presenting this on Zoom where I can't see any, you know, expressions or, uh, you know, reactions to this. Um, I could see Jamie's. <laughs> but I have had a lot of people really, um, you know, even though it's really obvious to me and, you know, it's, um, it's, um, it's obvious, but I think it needed, it needs to be spelled out. And for some people, you know, that not, um, not having any experience with indigenous communities, they connect to this model, um, you know, thinking about other communities that they're familiar with. Um, and it makes sense, you know, to understand like, oh, what are, it's really like, what are the values that are coming from different communities and how does it uh, radiate out into, you know, the ways that we act and the, the things that we do and the, the products that come from that and how does that come into our institution. So it's, it doesn't have to be specific to um, indigenous communities, um, that it can be applied to other types of communities. I think, you know, just that, you know, there's some really specific problems with indigenous um, you know, knowledge that, uh, that we talk about a lot, you know, as far as like sacred knowledge or, you know, people uh, getting access to different, you know, knowledge that's been published or, you know, all of these different problems, uh, labeling um, that we can talk about, you know, uh, this as a specific uh, moment. Um, but I think just for some people realizing that you know, this is just a way of understanding other ways of being and that there are other ways of looking at knowledge. Um, not everything, um, you know, we don't all come from the same values. Um, and it's just one way of, of, of making, that, um, making that more clear, I think. And I'm looking forward to, I'll be teaching that indigenous systems of knowledge again, um, class in the, uh, spring quarter for us uh, that starts in March um, and I haven't taught that class since like maybe for five years um, and so you know I've developed this model more so I'm looking forward to incorporating that into um, into the, the class um, and seeing how how students respond to it um, at that time Thank you, Sandy. And thank you for the great talk. <laughs> You're welcome. Other questions? Can, can, oh, should I raise my hand? Go ahead. Um, uh, Julie, do you want to ask or I guess I'll ask? Um, no, I'm, not, I'm happy to ask. I'm trying okay, to perfect. start myself up here. Yeah, um, Yeah. thank you so much for your time, Dr. Littletree, um, and for that talk. The question that I have is just that in your work, have you encountered any um, non-Indigenous um, institutions that, that get what you're talking about? Or that basically it's like, have you encountered good examples of this? Um, or any like models to offer of institutions that are doing this really well? Um, or is this really something that is aspirational and that um, you really haven't come across? And asking that from the perspective of like just looking for good models. 
Are you looking for like models from the library world or? Yeah, library specifically, but also archives would be of interest. There is um, there's a new series of um, case studies of, of li libraries and archives that are using the protocols for Native American archival materials. So I'd encourage you to, to look at those. Um, I think the American Philosophical Society has come up with one. Um, there are a lot of great examples and I, you know, I don't want to come across as saying that there's nobody doing good work. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of good examples. Um, uh, those case studies are, are good, uh, a good place. Like I said, the American Philosophical Society, um, ASU has um, uh, the Labriola Center uh, there at, at the U of A or at, at ASU. Um, and I'm gonna be blanking on different places. I see, um, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Jennifer O'Neill's picture and uh, different people in this group that probably could, could chime in um, better. Um, but I think, you know, I'm also thinking of um, UBC, uh, the Weehua Library um, on the campus of the University of British Columbia has uh, a really strong uh, indigenous focused library. Um, there's the um, uh, gosh, there's so many. <laughs> there are, Thank you so much. Yeah, and there, you know, that is my, my main, um, I uh, see Violet, oh, Violet's here. Um, the, so there's the, the protocols that are, that are mentioned there. Um, and they've been around for a long time. Um, there's places um, that are employing them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on like specific specific places um, but there are you know it is it, it's something that I think has been um, is getting more accepted you know to understand indigenous perspectives and um, you know it's not so foreign of an idea to think about um, indigenous um, you know different ways of being um, but I think there's still a lot of work to do and you know we do have uh, you know, years ago, we tried to get something passed with the American Library Association of like a statement of uh, respecting traditional cultural expressions and that that never got, um, you know, passed a, a council meeting because of, you know, people fearing, uh, you know, it's infringing on intellectual freedom, you know, restricting access to knowledge. Um, so there's still, there's still a ways to go, I think. Are there other? Yeah, thank you, sorry. Um, so uh, Jennifer O'Neill uh, provided a link um, to some additional information um, in the chat, if you all wanna look there. Um, there was an anonymous ask, what do you see as uh, immediate needs or interests that we as an LIS community can address either in tribal libraries or other libraries and archives? Or put another way, what are some action items that we can take in the LIS field to improve our work in support of indigenous interests? There, are, uh, there are a couple of questions after this. Okay. Um, I think taking. I mean, there's there's so much <laughs> that could be done. Um, I think part of it is. Um, Part of the problem is that it can't be immediate, that, you know, a lot of this has to take time, you know, to develop, you know, relationships and understanding. So I think there aren't any like really quick fix, you know, that, you know, we're going to put a display up of, you know, we're going to have, uh, you know, something easy to do, uh, you know, Native American Heritage Month or, you know, I think those types of, you know, quick, um, quick fixes are, uh, 
are, have shown to be not so effective, right? Um, so I think what really needs to be done is to t take the time to develop those uh, relationships with um, community, uh, with the land, with understanding their, you know, if, if you're in a, a place where you know there's indigenous people uh, that have relationships with land and water, um, taking time to um, also understand as best as that you can uh, where those perspectives are coming from um, and, you know, try to build that into you, to your practice of, um, you know, what is important um, to these, to these communities, whether you're in a urban or rural area, um, you know, speaking for myself, you know, coming here from the desert um, and, you know, moving to Seattle where there's a lot of water um, and, <laughs> You know, I have I've had to develop this new relationship with water here, and it's for me it's an ongoing thing, right? I'm I'm constantly trying to understand, you know, uh, this relationship with water and and how how does that impact, you know, libraries here, or archives, or you know, my practice as a as a teacher, where I'm um, it's not something that I'm you know comfortable with, but you know. It's something that I'm always trying to learn about. So it's it's continuous. Um, it's easier <laughs> for me that I've you know I've married into a, a tribe here, so I feel like I have a little bit of you know inside access. Um, but before that, you know, learning a, you know building relationships and friendships with people here um, has really been um, eye opening for me to to understand you know when I when I complain on social media about, you know, the rain here, I'm always thinking about like, oh, you know, what does it say about me as a guest here? Um, so I always have to question that um, for myself. Um, so, you know, just as a, um, that's kind of my long answer of, you know, that there are no quick fixes um, and, you know, trying to understand, um, you know, those, those histories of, um, of harm um, if you haven't engaged with that, I would, I would say take some time to learn about, um, you know, some of these um, impacts of colonialism, of, you know, the taking away of, of children and, you know, of treaties and, um, you know, try to educate, educate yourself about some of these issues um, before you start to try to come up with solutions. Um, because we have had a lot of, um, you know, solution-based projects. Um, you know, I teach a community engagement class and um, one of the things that I've changed in the way that I teach it is I don't, um, I don't require the students to come up with a solution. You know, they, they're all, you know, excited about some kind of a project, but um, to really take time to think about, you know, who's being left out and you know, how, how could you find a, a better way of, um, of dealing with this problem rather than, you know, trying to come up with, with a solution that may make sense to you. Um, you know, ask, try to build relationships and ask, ask them, you know, what would help. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it takes time. It takes time to build that. Hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from HMK. Uh, they say, something that has always helped my understanding as a non-Indigenous person is story. To hear someone's story can be inspiring for me. Would you have further thoughts on this part? Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, um, stories are a big, a big part of this. Um, I, re I love the word um, story work. Um, that Joanne Archibald uses, um, and I encourage you to uh, look at that book, um, Indigenous Story Work, um, where she talks about, you know, that, you know, stories are not just entertainment or, you know, it, it's, it's actually work for us to um, hear the stories, to be tellers of stories. Um, so it takes it out of that entertainment realm and really story work. Um, 
And so, you know, I think that, um, you know, understanding and really taking seriously those, those stories, whether they're personal stories or community stories, um, that is, you know, a real, um, a good way to, to engage with it. Um, on the flip side of it, um, there's also a lot of danger and there is some danger in, you know, some of those stories that are um, inaccurate or um, I'm thinking of um, Daniel Heath Justice's um, book, uh, what is it, uh, something that's on my shelf here. Um, but the, the beginning of the book is about, you know, the uh, remembering, you know, that there's humans behind these stories and, you know, being careful about, you know, the ethics and, you know, the types of stories that we, we tell and the harm. Um, there's that famous uh, passage from uh, Leslie Marmon Silco about, you know, once a story is out there, it's out there and, you know, there's that harm that can, can happen from that. So, you know, really taking stories um, seriously as a, as a serious um, source of knowledge and information, but also, you know, understanding how um, important they are for communities, for people, um, and being, um, holding those with that respect and, and responsibility. Thank you. Um, if you all want to look in the chat, there are a bunch of links that were shared um, for any of your interests. Um, and there are, are there any other questions? Um, if you do have, there aren't any in the chat, um, but if you do have one, please get it in there now. Yeah, I'm seeing the chat now and I'm seeing um, Jennifer's posted a bunch of links. Definitely, um, there's a webinar um, next week that she's going to be probably similar information um, about relationality and, uh, you know, there, she'll have definitely some better examples of archives and libraries that are doing this type of work. Um, and SAA um, has been doing a lot of really good work um, in, this, in this realm. And I see a link for Indigenous Story Work. Really encourage, I love that book. Um, we could talk about books, favorite books. When does my co-authored article come out? That is a good question. <laughs> um, I emailed them last night and they said they're, they're looking at page proofs. Um, so hopefully soon, but it's been like 18 months since we submitted it. So <laughs> it's been a while, um, but it's a special issue of knowledge organization about I think um, politics of knowledge. Um, so hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, there's also a typo in the article that I submitted. Um, so I'm hoping to, to fix that before it comes out. Um, but hopefully, yeah, as soon as it comes out, I'll, I'll, I'll blast it out because this is, you know, like I said, I've been presenting this uh, similar presentation for a while and I've given this presentation to a couple of different audiences. Um, so it'll be nice to have something that people can cite um, besides, um, you know, these presentations or have something, um, you know, that they can uh, point to uh, for this information. My husband was good enough to give me some tea while I was talking, so are there any other questions? There's nothing here on my end, so um, if you want, I don't know. <laughs> Did I see Cindy 
I think I thought I saw a hand up. Oh, yeah. Um, thanks so much for your talk. I'm actually an MLIS student at um, UW, and I'm looking forward to hopefully taking your class, Indigenous Systems of Knowledge, when it's offered later this year. Um, my question is about, um, so I'm interested in data science and particularly how it intersects with social justice. And as you were talking, it occurred to me how these ways of knowledge, of knowing that you were talking about, they, it's, it's kind of like a whole paradigm shift compared to the Western ways of like collecting data or um, what data is important and being able to be able to attach numbers to certain phenomenon or whatever. And um, this is kind of a broad question, but I was wondering how um, I'm trying to synthesize what you talked about and how that relates to data science and how um, I'm wondering how these indigenous ways of knowing could be used to I guess have a more holistic view of data science and what it means to collect data or collect information or to observe phenomenon based on observable things. Mm. Wow, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so there is, um, there is an area of indigenous um, data sovereignty, right? That some of you may have heard of, of um, a movement for you know, tribal communities to have more, have control of the data that is coming out of their communities, whether it's like educational statistics or, um, you know, health, uh, environmental, you know, that all of that needs to, uh, needs to be under the, you know, the, the control of, of tribes, right? So there's a lot of work in that area of, of uh, data sovereignty. Um, and so we actually, there's actually a, an article that I wrote, <laughs> co-wrote with uh, Marisa Duarte and Miranda Bellardi Lewis um, um, and another co-author um, about, um, about this uh, phenomenon of using uh, uh, indigenous data sovereignty and traditional knowledge, um, but looking at um, like some of the, the ways that people are, are describing um, this research. So we did, a, and I, I admit that I don't understand all of the magic that happens behind the, um, the analysis of uh, uh, the uh, the grabbing you know, of, of information that we were able to crunch the numbers. We had a computer scientist um, on our team that was able to do this, but we looked at the ways that people are uh, publishing about um, uh, indigenous knowledge um, in uh, the web of science um, database and how, you know, who's talking to each other and who's using the term indigenous, um, you know, a data sovereignty. Um, and there is a lot of um, there is a lot of talk about you know the need for indigenous communities to have control of it, but there isn't a lot of talk about um, the importance of relationality and understanding like the relationships of where um, this data is coming from, um, you know all of those interactions that have to happen um, to make sure that that data is is correct, um, you know who's who's collecting the data. Um, you know, what are the methods of collecting the data, um, how it's stored, you know, all of these other things that, you know, Nicole kind of mentioned um, in her question alluded to, you know, some of the problems of um, just even able to store data in tribal communities um, to uh, give access to it. Um, there's a, lo a lot of really complicated issues that we're still um, grappling with, you know, so it's one thing to say, you know, that we have to have um, control over this knowledge and control over this data, uh, which is great, but we also have to consider, you know, some of the technological issues 
and also like thinking about you know where even did this data come from and you know whose questions were asked to get this data um, you know what kind of methods do they use um, so you know understanding um, all of that process you know before um, you know taking into account um, um, you know that this data exists so that's that's one one area there's also um, I don't know if I don't have a I don't have the link here and I don't have the title but Marisa Duarte I'm a big fan she's she's a good friend and she's an awesome scholar I really look up to her she just wrote an article about COVID um, with data in um, Indian country and some of the issues with um, uh, you know collecting good data um, and how it's being dispersed or not um, you know there was a lot of um, a lot happening on the Navajo Nation um, and we were kind of keeping track of you know how that data was being shared and or not shared um, all of that kind of stuff I think is really um, those are big questions and I'm not a data scientist but it's something that I think that we have to uh, be more careful of and, and consider some of these um, issues that are happening um, behind the scenes rather than just um, accepting that you know that there's enough data and that um, you know that we can um, engage with it in a way that benefits Native communities. So yeah, Cindy, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, and I'd love to, you know, if, if I can share, um, share resources with you, um, I'd love to do that. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question and then Carrie Lynn has her hand up. Um, what's, what's your favorite book that you're reading right now? Oh, <laughs> oh, good question. Um, I have like 10 books on my desk right now and deciding which one. Um, probably a, a, a book that I'm, I'll, I keep going back to is um, Braiding Sweetgrass is one that I, I've gone back to maybe three or four times, especially during this pandemic. It's kind of a, a soothing place um, for me, especially the audiobook. Um, I'm, I loved, and I haven't gotten back to it, um, Spiral to the Stars is one that I've really, um, I loved and I want to get back to about uh, Muskogee uh, ways of knowing. And I was trying to write something about indigenous futurisms before this pandemic started. Um, so it's something I kind of want to get back to, uh, but thinking about, you know, the futures of libraries and you know how we're always thinking about the future anyway so it's kind of a moot, uh, not a moot point but it's you know something that we do anyway in, in libraries especially in for native communities um, so those are two that kind of stand down to me I'm, I'm always reading maybe four or five books at a time so it's kind of hard to those are those are some that stand out to me Thank you. Um, Carrie Lynn, do you want to ask your question? I just wanted to comment and maybe ask a question. Um, just going to swath over a bunch of things that have been talked about. So uh, one I wanted to mention that I put a link into the U.S. Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network because I did do research for them. And a lot of that data at the time that I did that research focused on census data, like right now in terms of U.S. Indigenous data. Um, most of the data warriors, what we call ourselves, are more focused on um, getting census control in indigenous nations and having that, uh, you know, even uh, like on the reservations and within the nations, and then also having um, those nations control those non-indigenous people that are living on the reservations and controlling those identities. So this is basically kind of what Sandy talked about is it's a, it's indigenous uh, data sovereignty is just data that's on by or about and so in these ways a lot of those inaccuracies get filtered through um, shifts in power in terms of uh, how that information um, exists and why it exists and there's very specific reasons for um, indigenous data sovereignty and they're defined for and about by the health and well-being of the nations so I just wanted to put, and you can see a lot of that work um, in the website uh, that I put for 
Um, that's uh, the NNI's work as co-sponsors of the Indigenous State of Sovereignty Network. And then that also is global, where a lot of the language is adopted from all of the progress that the Maoris have had in terms of their um, data sovereignty work. But that very much is really holistic in this relationality of their uh, reclaiming rights to water in terms of their relation, like literal relation to the water. Like when a Maori person says that they come from the water, they don't mean that like, uh, they mean that literally, like the water is related. And these are the kinds of writings that we're waiting for here in the US to talk about the actual relatedness to like indigenous people and strawberries and indigenous. And so then that would be the relatedness to all information about about strawberries and so then that would give those kinds of governance rights to that but so I just wanted to show that I put that link in there but I wanted to ask Sandy a question that kind of comes up with Jennifer O'Neill's um, event that's happening and my curiosity is about your experience um, but you might not have like a total um, answer because I was just wondering about the interdisciplinarity plenarity of the toolkit that you've created. And in terms of how, when I was looking at it, how inspiring um, it would be, and it must be, if you're teaching in LIS, but yet you have people who are majoring or minoring in other things taking your courses, and how you see um, what you've created change and shift research, which is a lot of what Jennifer's event is talking about in terms of indigenous studies is research, because I see this tool as something that can shift and change the way outside researchers take on the responsibility of the information within the repositories. You know, so those, it's kind of a slack that the repositories might not be um, having the ethics that we would like to see in terms of, you know, accurate information, uh, storage of information and access to information, but research should, reach, researchers can be introduced to your tool, like in your courses with assignments, and then that can shift and change the way they engage with the institutions. And I, I just was looking at that thinking, um, how um, in terms of indigenous studies and interdisciplinary um, work within indigenous studies like natural resources, um, education, how this model can change the way um, researchers approach institutions themselves. Totally, I think it could. And I haven't had a chance. I mean, I've, I've shared this with, um, I've done a similar, you know, short version of this presentation for our LIS, you know, they have to take a, a research methods class um, and I've shared it with them um, as you know as an, another percep uh, perception of you know how to do research um, I think it could be I think there's a lot of possibilities um, and maybe once it gets published um, you know we could have a, a bigger impact on, on different disciplines um, you know I've I've shared you know, I teach one undergrad class and I've, I've tried to incorporate some of this work um, in that area of, you know, having them, you know, think about uh, relationships and, you know, some of those deeper layers before they dive into like doing research with technology and creating digital tools. Um, but totally, yeah, I think it, I think there's a lot of possibilities um, for it to be, um, you know, not just libraries and archives, um, but uh, to impact research. Um, and I think it really just does, um, you know, build on the work of, um, you know, the decolonizing methodologies. And um, I, sometimes I feel like, like, like I said, I feel like it's sometimes it's not totally original. Um, like when I, when I look at it and, you know, when I talk about it and when I go through it, it just seems like common sense to me. And maybe it's just, you know, the more I think about it or, you know, just coming from these communities, it's, it's it starts, you start to forget that it's not the way that other people look at the world. And so when I share it out and when it's, you know, some aha moments or, you know, people can, can see uh, the uh, application of it to their own work, if, especially if they're not indigenous, um, it's, it's inspiring to me. And, you know, if, if it's one way that can, you know, bridge some um, understandings uh, that's really what I'm hoping uh, can come from this, um, that we can, you know, find some common grounds or, uh, 
you know, even if you don't employ indigenous uh, methodologies that you can understand, you know, your colleagues or students that want to use this type of um, thinking in their work and realize that it does come from somewhere, that it isn't just, uh, you know, something that someone is making up or, you know, to trust um, that it is, you know, based on other scholars and other researchers um, and that it, yeah, that it can inform um, a lot of different um, research practices um, and, and all kinds of different disciplines. And if you get to, you know, once it, I publish it, and I'd love to hear how people use it. I see uh, Mary Gibson wrote in here, you know, using this to help um, develop policy for a nonprofit. Um, I think there's a lot of different applications of it, and I'd love to hear, you know, what people think, you know, they can, they can use this as um, the, you know, the publication that it's coming out in is thinking about knowledge organization. Um, and that's one application of it. But, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of different places where it can be used. Thank you, Sandy. Other, other questions? I see Jamie popping back up. Well, I was just wondering if any, I see some of the students that I have in a class right now, wondering if you all had any questions. This is your big chance to have uh, Professor Sandy Littletree right here. And I know we're working on community-based archives and museums, and we talk a lot about uh, what is identity too? And when we think about how these archives are coming together, the conversations have been amazing. So I was wondering if there are any students that have any questions for Sandy. But maybe not. <laughs> and I did put my email on that last slide if people want to um, send me questions or uh, follow me. I didn't put my Twitter uh, Twitter profile, but you know, feel free to do that. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions or talk through some of these different issues um, anytime. Well, thank you. And, and I'm just going to wrap it up. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Sandy, for accepting my invitation to present. And I just think it what what you're doing, it's so important for so many of us in, you know, information studies more broadly to really reconsider the ways we're teaching and understanding relationality and the importance of that. And I want to say thank you to uh, Lauda Worth Mendoza, who helped uh, organize and facilitate the Q&A. And also thank you to Professor Berlin Loa for introducing you today. And Sandy, thank you so much for all of your wisdom and, and scholarship. So thank, thank you. you. And I'll, I'll be posting the recording probably in the, in the next few days. So. All right, thank all you right. all. Thank you all. <laughs>